I'm a stickler for timeliness. Settle down, friends. It's a wild morning, right? You guys are up. The bacon is good. The grits have butter in them. Uh, my name is Matthew Hurt. Welcome and good morning. Uh, welcome to the Leadership Institute's February Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast. Uh, as you may know uh, or recognize, I'm not Morton Blackwell, and he sends his best. He's actually he's unable to join us because he is traveling uh, for work, so he's out in Salt Lake City and wishes he could be with us uh, this week. As Morton says, we live in interesting times. And these times call for patriotic men and women to stand and fight for America's future and the freedoms enshrined in the vision of our founding fathers and in the words of our founding documents. Men like Major General John K. Singlaub, a friend of mine, a supporter of the Leadership Institute, and a longtime friend of Morton's. Retired Army Major General John Singlaub, a decorated veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and legendary special operator, died on January 29th at the age of 100. Singlaub, a native of Independence, California, commissioned as a U.S. Army Second Lieutenant following his graduation from the University of California, Los Angeles in 1943. Singlaub was quickly recruited by the Office of Strategic Services the precursor to both the Central Intelligence Agency and U.S. Army Special Forces. Will Irvin, a retired Army Lieutenant Colonel and author of The Jedbergs, The Secret History of the Allied Special Forces in France, 1944, told Military Times that Singlaub parachuted behind German lines in southern France as part of the OSS Project Jedberg. According to U.S. Army Special Operations Command, Singlaub was one of only 83 Americans selected for the program. Jedberg operatives, working in teams of no larger than four men, helped organize French resistance, no easy task, while also providing intelligence on and harassment of German lines of communication. Ultimately, Singlaub's efforts helped Allied forces break out of Normandy during the summer of 1944, following the surrender of Germany in May 1945, Singlaub was transferred to the Pacific Theater to continue OSS operations. On August 27, 1945, Singlaub parachuted with an eight-man team onto the Chinese island of Hainan, where they rescued hundreds of Dutch and Australian prisoners of war. Following the surrender of Japan, Singlaub remained in the Pacific, continuing to report on the Chinese Civil War. In 1951, Singlaub, now a major, was again off to war in Korea. According to the Army, from 1951 to 1952, Singlaub served as the deputy commander and chief of staff of the Joint Advisory Commission Korea, or JAC, as it was known, represented the first time the CIA formed a clandestine services field mission. His name is John, but he also went by Jack. In addition to recovering down pilots, the shadowy organization attempted to replicate aspects of the OSS missions during World War II. After his tour with Jack, Singlaub commanded a conventional infantry battalion in Korea where he was awarded the Silver Star. In 1966, Singlaub once again returned to leading unconventional forces when he was selected to lead the Military Assistance Command Vietnam Studies and Observation Group. Commonly known as Mac V. SOG, or simply SOG, Singlaub was tasked with leading an organization comprised of special operators from all military branches as they fought North Vietnamese communist guerrillas in both Vietnam and neighboring countries. A significant target of SOG was the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This communist supply line existed mainly outside of Vietnam, thus technically off limits, according to the rules of engagement of the day. As Chief SOG Jack fought the bureaucracy to get close air support for SOG teams, he fought with the State Department to have our teams better armed in Cambodia in the early days of the operation, John Stryker Meyer, a SOG veteran and ex-Green Beret said. He always cared deeply about the men who served along, alongside and under him. Irwin echoed Meyer's comments about Singlaub's dedication to those he served alongside. According to Irwin, in 1988, he received a call from Singlaub regarding Singlaub's South Vietnamese counterpart from his time in SOG. After the war, the former South Vietnamese officer settled in Los Angeles and lost his home to a fire. 
The officer lost everything, Irwin told Military Times, and one thing he lost that he cherished was his yearbook from the Command General Staff College. Irwin found a replacement for Singlaub, and the gesture was symbolic of the kind of person and leader Singlaub was. Quote, it just struck me at the time how much he valued that relationship, Irwin said. Singlaub's last command in the Army was as Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army Forces in South Korea. In 1977, he was relieved from this position after publicly criticizing then-President Jimmy Carter's proposal to withdraw U.S. troops from Korea. Over his career, Singh Laub received two Distinguished Service Medals, the Silver Star, two Legions of Merit, two Bronze Stars, the Soldier's Medal, the Purple Heart, the Air Medal, the Combat Infantryman's Badge, the Master Parachutist Badge, and the Army Aviation Badge, as well as more than a dozen international accolades. In 2006, Singh Laub was inducted into the U.S. Army Ranger Hall of Fame, and in 2007, he was made a distinguished member of the Special Forces Regiment. In 2016, the Army established the Major General John K. Singh Laub and Jedburgh Award to recognize the exceptional members of the Army Commando community. He spoke at this breakfast in February 2003. I first met General Singh Laub on a Leadership Institute donor visit where he shared stories of his service and gave me a copy of his book, Hazardous Duty, in which he inscribed, to Matthew, a fellow combatant in the war against liberalism, with best wishes, Jack. I encourage you to live tweet today's event. The hashtag is on the screen. In 2021, your Leadership Institute trained 12,216 conservatives at 650 separate programs. Thank you. <clears throat> Since 1979, the Leadership Institute has trained 243,004 activist students and leaders. You have before you allies scheduled for the upcoming months, including a campaign management school next week here in this building. Please take a moment to review these schools and consider attending one or sending a friend to a training. If you are watching online, welcome. Visit our website at leadershipinstitute.org training to see upcoming online and in-person events. I'll now introduce Andrew Butte. Andrew Butte is a development intern. He is from Parker, Colorado, and recently returned from living abroad in Nicaragua. Andrew did a semester at the University of Nebraska, Omaha, before deciding to take a break from college until the pandemic um, is over. He's actively involved with Turning Point USA and has attended two Turning Point USA student action summits. Outside of school, Andrew loves to play sports with friends, free diving in the ocean, and watching movies. Andrew also loves all kinds of board games and is currently studying to achieve the national master title in chess. Uh, Andrew, would you please come up here? Uh, good morning. Um, if everyone could please uh, bow their heads and pray with me. God, thank you for bringing us all together here this morning. Thank you for the breakfast, and we ask that you would bless the hands that provided it. Thank you for the Leadership Institute and the important work that it does. Um, thank you for allowing uh, Mr. Grover Norquist to come and speak to us today. We ask that you would bless the words that he has for us this morning. Lord, we are blessed to live in the United States of America we ask that you would place a hand on our country and guide it in a path of righteousness. I pray that everyone would be able to learn something new and valuable this morning. And finally, I pray that um, you would protect everyone as they travel home from breakfast. Amen. Now we are going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. So if everyone could please stand if they are able and face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, 
indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Now for the program's report, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dina Espenscheid. Dina Espenscheid came to the Leadership Institute back in 2016, fresh off the Donald Trump for President campaign. She brought with her more than 20 years of experience in grassroots organizing, volunteer management, and citizen lobbying at the local, state, and federal level. She is the Leadership Institute's Director of Grassroots Coalitions, and quite frankly, I'm surprised she's in the building today with as much traveling as she does training activists across the country. Now she will talk about recent strategic trainings in the Allied Grassroots team uh, that they have brought to activist groups across the U.S. as well as those events coming up. Good morning. They told me I could have one minute if I told statistics and a minute 35 seconds if I told stories. So let me tell you a little bit about the grassroots team. The work that we do in the here in the building is immense and super important. But not everybody can travel to Arlington, Virginia for a training. So the grassroots team is the team inside the programs division that takes everything that's done in the building out onto the road. So later this month, we have a, a four-day campaign management school. Well, back in December of 2020, yes, during the pandemic, we took the four-day campaign management school, made it into what we call an academy when we're on the road, and we did it in Florida for about 125 people. Two of the people at that academy were Tina Deskovich and Maria Marie Rogerson. You may recognize their names because it was at that school in Tampa where they sat down and they said, we need a mom's group that's fighting for our kids. We need a mom's group that is working towards bringing freedom into our classrooms. We need a Moms for Liberty. Moms for Liberty is now the fastest growing parents group in the nation with over, oh my gosh, I forgot the exact number, but that would be a statistic and I was told I couldn't do statistics. Let's just say thousands and thousands of members. We are working with Moms for Liberty chapters across the country to bring trainings to people like these moms and dads across the country. And uh, last month in Sarasota, we did a training in conjunction with Moms for Liberty that had over 120 people at it. That was a school board training, trying to get people ready to win their school boards. Uh, we did one in Jacksonville that had 55 moms at it, talking about how to talk to moderates and liberals. And tomorrow I get the leave for um, um, Indian River County, Florida. I know tough life that I have trying to escape the uh, cold here in Florida uh, to go down to do a, a training that is a school board training where we're going to be teaching candidates. Uh, we've also got trainings in Nevada and Idaho and across the country. And now my minute 35 seconds is up. Thank you guys very much and have a great day. Thank you, Dina. I just randomly had a brand new Moms for Liberty chapter leader in uh, Washington State last week who said, I heard about the Leadership Institute training from another Mom for Liberty. Can you connect me? I connected her with Dina. And within minutes, Dina replied, I'll actually be out in the Pacific Northwest later this week. Can we meet now? So uh, it's, it's excellent what the grassroots team and in particular what Dina is, is doing out in the field. Um, I'd like to thank, of course, none of this. Uh, would be possible without the generous investment of Leadership Institute donors and supporters. Thank you so much for your faithful support of these crucial grassroots trainings across the United States. I'm now going to introduce Gianfranco Bravo uh, to introduce our speaker. Gianfranco Bravo is the campus reform intern. He is from Hollywood, Florida, sorry, <laughs> and is a graduate of the University of Florida. He earned a bachelor's degree in political science and minored in mass communications. He served as the tabling chair, very important role, for his Turning Point USA chapter at the University of Florida. He also worked on local and federal campaigns in North Central Florida, such as the Donald J. Trump campaign in 2020. Jim Franco, please come introduce our speaker. All right, good morning, everybody. So I would just want to say it's an honor and a privilege to be here to introduce Mr. Grover Norquist. Mr. Norquist is the president for, of Americans for Tax Reform, a taxpayer advocacy group formed in 1985 
at the request of Ronald Reagan. The ATR works to decrease the size and cost of government and oppose higher taxes at the federal, state, and local level. It supports tax reform that aims to uh, tax spent income at one time at a flat rate. The ATR organizes the Taxpayer Protection Pledge, which asks candidates at the federal and state level to commit in writing to oppose all net taxes for the American people. In the 115th Congress, 212 House members and 45 senators all pledged to this uh, organization. He chairs a DC-based Wednesday meeting where 150 uh, elected officials, political activists, and movement leaders all come by weekly. Meetings started in 1993 and take place at the ATR conference room. Mr. Norquist graduated from Harvard University, earning a master's and a bachelor's in economics. He now lives in DC with his wife, Sama, and two daughters. Ladies and gents, let's give it up for Mr. Grover Norquist. Thank you very, very much. Delighted to be here. Um, I was just on a Zoom call with the main center right meeting uh, and uh, reminded everybody there that they needed to uh, make sure that all the young people that they work with get involved in the Leadership Institute as well. And we sent out to everybody the contact information. So hopefully some more people coming in from Maine. Oh, OK. Yeah, thank you very much. That's good advice. I'll do this. Um, where are we? Where have we come from? How are we doing? What do we do next? Are we winning? Are we losing? Um, I want to start by asking you to take this chart, which I passed around. Um, there are three handouts. Always important to hand out lots of paper handouts, given what Trees did to Sonny Bono. Um, no recycling them. This shows partisan control of the House and Senate since 1932. Um, the, the Senate's up top, and the bottom is the House. And as you look at the first 62 years, up until that bright yellow line, that Republicans held the House and the Senate. This is, this is Congress, right? Okay, The Congress, one of the three branches of government without which you can do nothing. They held the House and the Senate for four years of 62 years. Okay, The PRI in in Mexico, the, the party of the institutionalized revolution, they never had this one party control for as long as the Democrats did here in the United States. You know, oh, we're bipartisan. One party control, 62 years. Sure, did we elect Republican presidents every once in a while when the Democrats got too corrupt or gave away too many countries to the Soviets? Yes. But then the D's would just decide, well, we'll wait them out, you know, so we won't get socialism in this industry now. As soon as Nixon's gone, we'll do it, okay? Um, and they did, and they would wait them out. Something happened in 94. Uh, and since 94, the Republicans have held the House and the Senate more than half the time. More than half the time. You wonder why the Democrats are grumpy. It's not just Trump. They started getting really grumpy not when 94 hit, because they were quite sure this was temporary. They saw this in, in the early 50s for two years and the late 40s for two years, and we'll be out. And I talked to Democrat lobbyists who at the time, oh, yeah, yeah we'll get the House and Senate back right away. It didn't happen, because the, the Republicans actually governed reasonably well and were able to make the case for electing themselves. Now, uh, what happened? In 94 is the year that more than 95% of all the Republican candidates signed the Taxpayer Protection Pledge and said, I'm never raising taxes, okay? Now, well, why was that like a big deal? Well, in 88, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush uh, was won the primary to become the Republican nominee. He won it because he signed the pledge and Dole wouldn't. And in the television televised debate a few days before New Hampshire, uh, Pete DuPont, who was up on the podium, handed the pledge to uh, Dole and said, we've all signed the pledge never to raise taxes. You haven't. Remember, Dole's liability was he was the tax increaser fighting Reagan during much of Reagan's eight years, the Republican tax increaser fighting Reagan on those issues. I mean, 
hero from World War II, but he never quite understood the concept of stop giving the government more money to hire more democratic precinct workers. Um, and he lost the primary. Well, he, well, first of all, he reacted on television like he was a vampire and somebody tossed a, a cross in his lap. Um, and so the, the visual there wasn't good for him. Uh, and he lost. It uh, didn't, didn't lost the uh, primary. And Bush was the nominee. At the convention, Bush was 14 points down to Dukakis. 14 points. He was losing to Mike Dukakis, okay? There's something wrong with you if you're losing to Mike Dukakis. Um, <laughs> And then that's when he said, read my lips, no new taxes, and he went ahead and he won the election, having promised. He put it in writing, that's the pledge. And by the way, somebody said that the pledge is to Americans for tax reform. No, no, no. The pledge is to the American people. Uh, Obama used to always say, why is everybody signing these pledges to Grover? Uh, why does he get to run everything? Um, and while I thought that might be a good way to organize things, it's not the way we've organized things. Uh, the pledge is to the American people uh, never to support or vote for a tax increase. And if you're a governor or a uh, president candidate, you promise to oppose and veto. If you're a regular state legislator, congressman, senator, to oppose and vote against. Oppose and vote against is so they can't vote for it in committee <laughs> and, and then vote against it once when it didn't matter anymore. So oppose, whenever the opportunity, oppose it and vote against it. Um, and you can't, well, anyway, there are various ways to sort of step out of the way and let something happen. The pledge is to make sure that that doesn't pass the laugh test. Um, so Bush won. Uh, and he governed quite well for four years. He uh, managed the collapse of the Soviet Union. He got uh, uh, Ukraine not to be part of the Soviet Union. Fifteen different republics, it broke up. Not a lot of blood on the floor, which is not how anybody thought the Cold War uh, would, would end. Uh, extremely well done. He kicked Iraq out of Kuwait and didn't stick around for two generations to occupy the place. Um, he did a very good job. Uh, he had one problem. He shot one hole in the bottom of the boat. He raised taxes and he lost, okay? So that's in 94, all of the Republicans with the six guys in the House and a couple in the Senate didn't sign the pledge, everyone else did, and they said, you know what, we're never voting for a tax increase, period, not happening. Well, what about this tax increase? No, no tax increase, period. Uh, and we swept the House and the Senate, uh, and, and we have not had a tax increase since 1994 if the Republicans had the House or the Senate. Okay, only when the Democrats have the House, Senate, and presidency, all three, are they ever have been able to raise taxes. So the Republicans have never have, have not, not broken their pledge. They've held together on that, uh, and that was extremely important in making the Republican Party the party that would not raise your taxes. And now there are a lot of other issues in the world, but I'm not going to raise your taxes. Get you pretty close to 50 percent while you talk about other issues uh, as well. Plus, if you're not giving the government money, a lot of other issues don't come up, okay? If you're not feeding the other team, they can't be at your throat quite so quickly. Um, passed out here is the list of federal people who've taken the pledge. We have uh, the very back, you'll see some congressmen and senators who've not taken the pledge. Please talk to them if you run into them. Um, and I mean, some of them literally will tell you they never got it from us, you know, the campaigns are busy and so on. We just need to keep reminding them. Uh, I can't think of anybody who, in, among the Republicans who wants to raise taxes, but still, we need it in writing. We want to make it public. Um, this is the other playing field, okay? I mean, politics, you, get, you can get confused in Washington, D.C. if you think it's all about the President, the House, and the Senate. This tells you the strength of the Republican and Democratic parties in the United States. We have 57 or so states, and... Um, the red states here have a Republican governor and both houses Republican, okay? The yellow states have both houses Republican, but they have a Democrat um, governor for some reason. And Louisiana, our candidate had too many girlfriends. It's Louisiana. I mean, we're not counting none, but too many was too many. Um, and, you know, so there, we had some mistakes. The, yellow, the yellows are mistakes, governor mistakes. Uh, those are states that really would like to be uh, Republican states. The blue states are complete Democrat, House, Senate, Governor, and their uh, uh, green states, uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, and uh, Maryland, where again, the Democrat gets too corrupt, they elect a Republican, but it really is a, is a blue state. It, it's just waiting to get a different governor uh, when they have the opportunity to do that. 
how are we doing? Well, I would argue we're doing reasonably well. We tricked the other team into seizing power, and now they're going to have to live with it. Um, but it's still kind of 50-50, so they don't get to do everything they want to do. But this is where the real action is. Right now, it's, it's very important. Mitch McConnell stopping them breaking the filibuster saves the country. This is important. Everything is don't let them break the filibuster. Don't let them break. The, you have to take a half a step backwards. Whatever it is, you have to stand on your head. Keep the filibuster. And keeping the filibuster has meant they can't change labor law. If they change labor law, one of the reasons you had... 62 years of Democrat control as they created organized labor as a funding source for the modern Democratic Party. You want to work in this country, you will pay union dues, the union will kick the money back to the Democratic Party, we will vote to give the, the unions more power to get more things. 33% of working people in the United States in the 1950s, 33% of people in the private sector were paying union dues, which was then kicked back to the modern Democratic Party. That's how they funded their campaigns. The bulk of them, now they have trial lawyers too, uh, that's it, which is an important group, but still organized labor is the dominant force. That said, only six now, it's down under six percent of private sector workers have joined a union and are paying union dues. Only six percent. Now, it's about a third of government workers, so it's maybe 10, 11 percent total, um, but that is way down from where it was, and that explains a great deal of the secular decline uh, of the modern Democrat Party and its ability to fund itself. The law, the PRO Act that they wanted to pass would have ended right to work in all 50 states. It would have said you don't ever have to have an election to force people to join a union. Somebody will come and visit you at 11 o'clock at night, ask you to sign something, and that signature will be your vote. Like a nice house you have here, nice kids, nice wife, you want to sign or not. Um, and when you get 51 signatures, that's a union and everybody's in forever. Um, and that has been stopped to date. But you know the, our conservative hero on the Democratic side, Manchin, he's for that. So is the lady from uh, Arizona. They're all for it. They're just those two weren't willing to break the filibuster to get that. That's what the filibuster protects. And the other one is is uh, having the federal government seize control of all federal elections and mail everybody three or four letters, uh, all with ballots in them whenever they want to, and no voter ID being allowed. Um, it, it would be another. 62 years before the Republicans could get off the mat if they changed labor law or election law in the way that they would like to do it. Stopping that has been the, the central step in the right direction. Um, so where are we? Um, well, I would argue that just keep in mind who our team is and their team is and how they get organized. Ours is a, since Reagan, both organized, visualized it, organized it, and then understood it, is a coalition of groups and individuals that on the issue that moves their vote, not all issues, but on the issue that moves their vote, what they want from the government is to be left alone. Think if you're sitting around a table of fellow conservatives, Reagan Republicans, and what would, what, and they say, so what's the most important issue to you that you vote on? Okay. You've got people who vote on the Second Amendment, okay? And they don't, what do they want? Do they insist that, uh, Schools teach kids books entitled Heather Has Two Hunters? No. They don't knock on your door on Saturday. You should go hunting. They just want to be left alone uh, with the Second Amendment. That's 21 and a half million Americans have a concealed carry permit. 21 and a half million Americans have a concealed carry permit. We thought that number would decline, went up by a million and a half last year. It's now about a third women. It's increasingly women um, getting, getting permits. Uh, and it's, 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 as the Democrats like to say, it's also increasingly diverse in terms of who's decided that the government is not taking it seriously, that they need to be protected, and people are getting uh, uh, permits. But 21 states now have constitutional carry which I believe started in Arizona when nobody wanted to get a permit because they just wanted to carry their gun anyway, and the police would say, hey, you really need a permit, and they take their little pocket constitution out and say, this is my permit, constitutional carry. Um, so eventually they passed laws to fit with what everybody was doing anyway, um, and we have 21 states now have constitutional carry. Now, you want to get a permit if you're going to go to another state and want to carry a gun with you because they have reciprocity in between the states. But if you're just staying in your state, you don't need one. You don't have to get a permit. So we thought there'd be this drop in, well, I'm not going to re-up my permit because I'm not traveling. You know, I just 
live in Alaska. I don't visit everyone. Uh, it, that hasn't happened. That hasn't happened. That's a, num that's a group that continues to grow. Hunters have been declining, secular decline, about 25% uh, a year, mostly bird hunters going down. The deer hunters are, are still there, but it's just more difficult to go hunt birds somewhere. The number of farmers within driving distances gets further and further away from cities and suburbs. It's not as easy to be a bird hunter as it, as it used to be. Deer hunters not moving. But it's not about hunting, of course. The Second Amendment was never about hunting. It's about protection, uh, and it's about the right of people to be armed. But go around the table, people who um, homeschool, okay? 40 years ago, illegal in 48 states. 40 years ago, illegal in 48, go to jail, illegal. It was called truancy. They came and arrested your parents for it. Um, and now it's legal in all 50 or 57 states, if Obama's right. Um, and it's a growing movement. It's been 2 or 3 percent. I'm not even sure if I can quite believe the numbers they're talking about now, but bold. Um, am I doing something wrong that makes it click in and out? Okay. Um, I'm squeezing it too hard and not getting the juice through. Um, <laughs> electricity. Uh, so this is a movement. Oh, this looks the same. Okay. Um, <laughs> Second Amendment, uh, concealed carry permits, shall issue concealed carry permits really only, st Florida was the first state with stoplights that had uh, shall issue concealed carry permits, okay? That was 1986. Before that, you had to know the mayor to get a permit. And in LA, you still have to know the mayor to get a permit. Um, but 44 states now have shall issue. They can't tell you no, you don't have to give them, what's the reason? It's not your business what my reason is. <laughs> I, you, I want to have a second of uh, my gun. Um, so we've changed the laws to give more people freedoms, which they take very seriously, and they now defend more than they would defend. You can't defend homeschooling until you've done it, right? You don't really feel, com you know, you, it's not a big part of your life until you're doing it. You, you, could, you could think about it, but people don't go to the barricades for things that, well, maybe it'd be nice to do X. But I'm doing X, and now they want to take it away. I have a concealed carry permit, now they want to take it away. That get, taxpayers, don't raise my taxes. Small businessmen and women, don't interfere with my ability to run a small business. The whole gig economy, 16% uh, of Americans have done something in the gig economy, whether it's you know, Uber or Lyft or Etsy or uh, you know, uh, buying and selling and, and moving stuff around, 9% uh, in any given year. Okay? That's, a, that's a pretty good chunk of the, um, of, the econ of the economy that are, that are actively, in it. and for 3% three, three it's their full-time job. For some people it's an additional thing, but 9% of people in any given year participate in that. The left and the labor unions have announced, not announced, they're passing laws in states to ba basically make independent contractor law, gig economy, uh, side hustles illegal. Everybody has to have a boss, because if you have a boss, you can be forced to join a union, and if you can be forced to join a union, you can pay union dues, which makes the Democrats happy, and they're trying to shut down all of those efforts in the gig economy to make it difficult, independent contractor law they're trying to change. Um, so as you go around, the people, religious liberty, people from the most important thing in life is practicing their faith, transmitting it to their kids. Again, the, people don't go around asking for Episcopalian stamps, okay? Um, they just want to be left alone to practice their faith so that those other guys on the other side of the table can go to Hades because they completely misunderstand Leviticus. Um, and, but it's not, but the whole idea of religious liberty and allowing people to be left alone is exactly what the left can't do. So as you go around the table, you've got all these different structures, people who, charter schools, three million people have kids in charter schools. Now it's kind of halfway between a private school and the government running, unions running everything. But the people who have escaped into charter schools do not want to go back, okay? They, they sound like the people who just got to the other side of the Berlin Wall. They go, I'm not going back. You can't make me go back. Uh, they don't want that to happen. Uh, and all of the people around the table, each has a different reason for voting for the candidate who will leave them alone, which is why, for starters, the tax issue is a very nice, you know, we don't want to give the government more money to do more things to mess with us, period, okay? Maybe they should be doing less things, period, but not more money to do more projects, and so that's a unifying issue. There isn't a wing of the Republican Party that wants to raise taxes, um, but as you go around the table, the guy who wants to make money all day looks over at the guy who wants to go to church all day and says, it's not how I spend my time. But it's not necessary that we agree on what we do with our liberty. 
We just want the government to leave us alone to do what we want. And the guy who wants to fondle his guns all day, eh, that's not what I do with my time. Hey, don't bother me. Okay, fine. We're all in the room. We vote for the guy in the middle who says, I can leave your kids alone, your guns alone, your faith alone, your small business alone, your investments alone, your 401ks, your IRAs. Half the country is in the stock market now because of 401ks, IRAs, and defined contribution pensions. It used to be 10%. So the Democrats go, oh, these bad people who invest in the stock market, you know, 10% of the population in the 1960s, it's now more than half, okay? And people who have $5,000 invested in the stock market are 20% more Republican than people who don't. All demographic groups move more uh, uh, to the right, to the Republican Party, if you own, it doesn't have to a lot of stock, just enough to realize that it, that it matters to people. Um, and so that's our coalition. And what do we want? We want to be left alone. We always want to be looking for new people. Um, I don't know if the, the last election, uh, 13 million Americans vape. They've quit smoking. They vape. It's, it's, it, there's no stuff that goes in that gives you cancer or anything. Um, and uh, the Democrats want to stop that because it looks like smoking um, and therefore should be squashed. Uh, that's how Johnson won the Senate race in Wisconsin. He organized every vape shop in the state. And on election night, in, into the cameras, I won because of the vaping vote. He ran 20,000 votes ahead of Trump uh, in, 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 in 16. Uh, and a whole bunch of state legislators have lost elections over that too. Now you go, well, I, I didn't even know. Keep a lookout who's being messed with by the government. They're your opportunity to get them into the modern Republican uh, Party. Now, the other team is the Takings Coalition. They think the proper role of government is not to leave you alone. Oh, and I, I include in the leave us alone stuff, the, the military and the police are part of that. We want the government, we do want to be left alone by the Soviet Union or other countries that might, Canada, keep an eye on them. Um, and that's, so you want a reasonably sized military to keep the Canadians on their side of the border. Um, but with the guns pointed outward, not inward, as some other countries do. Uh, and the same thing with, with police. You don't want police to go stealing people's money, civil asset forfeiture, but you do want them stopping criminals from stealing your stuff and, and bothering you. Um, how many more minutes do I have? Okay, well, I don't know about that, but okay. Um, my little thingy there has died on me. Okay, um, so uh, I just want to make clear to, to include in the Leave Us Alone that part of the government that actually helps leave you alone, that enforces con the things that are mentioned kind of in the Constitution from time to time, those are, <laughs> those are vaguely okay. Some of them, I think the post office was a big mistake, Ben Franklin, shame on you, but everything else in the Constitution is just fine uh, and generally useful. <laughs> we should check in with it every once in a while, which is not something all the congressmen and senators do, um, and we'll get to the post office eventually. But the other team, the Takings Coalition, they view the proper role of government as taking things from some people, giving them to others, usually money, usually them. Uh, trial lawyers, big funding source of the Democratic Party, you want to be able to sue anybody for anything uh, for cash, organize labor, particularly the public sector unions. Some of the private sector unions look like our team because they want to be able to build things and do stuff and all the regulations keep them down. The private, the public sector doesn't have any of those problems. Um, that you know, they, they can do everything just getting more tax money than just get everybody a pay increase uh, in their union. Uh, so government workers are a big part of the Dems coalition. The two wings of the, depend, of the, of the welfare uh, issue, the dependency, a movement people who are locked into welfare dependency and people who make $120,000 a year managing the dependency of other people, making sure they don't get jobs and become Republicans. Um, and so as, as the left tries to organize its team, then they have all the coercive utopians, the sort of the cultural left. These are people who are better than you and me and, and they, they know how to run our lives better than we do and they certainly know how to run our kids' lives better than we do. Uh, it, 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 the folks who... Um, insist that on the Sabbath you separate the green glass from the white glass from the brown glass for the recycling priests uh, and they're the ones who come up with the light bulbs that don't completely light the room convince you you have gl glaucoma uh, they they mandated those the, the, the toilets that don't flush completely um, and they have more rules about what you have to do and you can't do. It's slightly longer and more tedious than Leviticus. It just goes on and on and on. Don't do that, don't do that. Um, and, but they want to enforce it through law. Um, so around the left's table, we get along because nobody wants anything at anybody else's expense around our table, right? You want to be free to do that? You want to be free? I want to be left alone? Okay. I think that's odd. I don't 
do that, but if you do, okay, fine, you know. Um, and uh, so we don't have to agree on how you lead your life, just that you lead it without bothering other people and coercing them into doing things. Around the left's table, as long as we're stupid enough to throw more money into the center of the table, and that's how all Democrat presidencies start. Remember, Carter, stimulus package, throw a bunch of money in the table. It's like $20 billion. That was when they were cheaper. Uh, and then Obama gets in, and it was like a you know a trillion dollars to start with. And then this guy, two trillion, and you want another five trillion on top of that. Why is the first thing they do, grab a bunch of money and throw it in the center of the table? Because all the people in the Democratic coalition sitting around the table are going, I helped elect you. I want my payoff. I want mine. Give me what you promised to give me, which is why they're having such a hard time taking the $5 trillion they want. Remember when they thought they were going to get $2 trillion out of Manchin, uh, and now he's going, well, I don't know if we're going to even give you that, but so it's getting smaller. But five to three, two didn't work because the, look at everyone around the table. Who are you going to tell? You know, <laughs> thanks for all your work and helping elect me, but you get nothing because we're going to pay these guys and you're out. Well, on the Democratic Party, if they don't win the election, they don't eat, okay? This is, this, is, this is not a side hustle on their part. This is their job. This is what they do and get paid for. Uh, and so you can't just decide to pay off some of the guys because, anyway, nobody's going to walk away from that table and go, oh, it's okay. I'll get back to me later. Maybe in the past they would have, you know, after we win the next election, give me a little more than, you know, that's the deal. Nancy Pelosi actually said out loud, this is a once in a century opportunity. Democrat, progressive, I don't know what he is, but anyway, he's, he's, under, he's under the direction of progressives, uh, president, and then a House and Senate controlled by progressives as well. And she says that won't happen for another 100 years. I hope she's right. I'm not as certain of it as she is. But I think it's probably true to say it's going to be some time before those stars align. And since we've had that, we've had all three for half of the time, 60% of the time, since 94, it's going to be a long time for them. And by the way, when they do do something stupid, we can undo it. Um, and we just need more Republicans than we've been able to put together in the Senate. Uh, but since there's 60, 30 states that are Republican, we ought to be having 60 senators regularly. Somehow we need to, uh, we finally got North and South Dakota to knock this off of sending us these Bolshevik senators um, while being reasonably sane in their own state. Um, but we still have a few lagging indicators, Montana. Um, Virginia, we've got to re redo Virginia. Um, but there are a number of states where frankly we just need to, to catch up there. So um, as we move forward, one, Stop feeding the other team. The reason the pledge is so important is to say, no new taxes. Well, if you're not raising more taxes and throwing more money in the center of their table, the left gets along if after the election, as they did under Clinton, Obama, and uh, now uh, Biden, because uh, they can do that thing like at the at, after the bank robbery and the TV movie, right? One for you, one for you. Everybody around the table, very happy, because a big pile of money just robbed the bank, and all the guys who helped rob the bank, they all, they all get some money. But after a while, if we don't raise taxes, if we say no new taxes and mean it and, and hold it, um, what, what we do is that that begins to dwindle down, okay? That big thing of cash dwindles down, and you think it's still a lot of money there, but it's, as far as they're concerned, it's like the Kennedy kids, and there's one six-pack in the middle of the table, and there's, <laughs> there's not enough for everybody. This is not working. Um, and then they become grumpy, and if we don't feed them taxpayers, they will cheerfully gnaw on the guy sitting next to them, all right? Um, and they'll go, you away from the table, this is mine now, uh, and they'll fight, they'll fight. And so our job is to no new taxes, stop putting money on the table, make them fight and chew on each other so that two years from now and four years from now, there are fewer of them around the table and they're all shorter um, and, and, and less able to do damage to us. So our coalition, wants to be left alone. You need to understand, people will talk about lots of issues. What you need to find out is what's the vote moving issue for somebody. Uh, you can a talk radio, people talk about, they'll talk about their sixth issue, right? Um, but what do they vote on? And that's what you need to connect with them on. And the good news is the voting issue is the one that doesn't cost any money. Bush used to talk to somebody and he, they'd agree with them and they'd say, what else do you want? Bush, shut up, you got the one. Don't ask them what else they want. One fish, one hook, that's it, 
okay? You do not, Phyllis Schlafly had a great line, everybody's allowed to vote for their own reason for my candidate. Um, <laughs> and once you discover that reason, it's not important to go, well, you know, you really should understand this issue too. Later, not during an election campaign. Get the vote, go get another fish, one more hook, and keep moving. A um, Couple of quick thoughts. We get confused sometimes because we for forget that what we need to do is build a coalition of people who all agree, who don't all agree on everything. They're not going to, right? You ever try and get six people to agree what restaurant to go to? Okay, they're 330, 40 million Americans and you, we wanna convince half of them to vote for our candidate for the same reason, not happening. Okay, um, but for many different reasons. So if you think of this huge Venn diagram with people who want to vote because of guns or taxes or education or homeschooling or for, uh, defending the country foreign policy or stopping crime and, 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 and everyone's there. So I want someone to vote for my candidate if they're good on guns or they're good on religious liberty, not and. And is the overlap of the Venn diagram. It's smaller than or, okay? There are fewer people who are good on guns and life and taxes and small businesses and understanding what an independent contractor is, okay? That's a very small group in the middle. That's where you want to find your candidates, the people who get each of those. So they can look around the room and go, I'm going to leave you alone and you alone and you alone and you alone and you alone. Um, you, but if those are the only, unless you're planning on taking over by grabbing the radio stations uh, and, and the rail, rail lines, um, you, you need 51%. You need 60% because the other team will steal some and some of your candidates have DWIs they forget to mention until um, the week before the election. So earn 60% of the vote, get 51 plus, govern, all right? Not, we're gonna earn 51% of the vote. Yeah, we're just gonna be so hardcore that only 51% will vote for us and some will forget and some will be mad about the DWIs and no, 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 no. 51 is a, it's not a bad number to end up on, <laughs> just more than 50, but you really need to earn closer to 60 to be sure that you'll have 51 because the other team does steal votes, no matter what they say, it's still true, <laughs> they do. Um, and we just need to, to overwhelm them on that. So. Politics is or not and. Your candidate, you want to be good on this and this and this and this and this. That's to hold the coalition together. But your coalition is people who are good on this or that or that. Now maybe over time some of them get two or three or all of the conservative. That's fine. That's a bonus. You still only get one vote. Okay. So I wouldn't spend a lot of time on that project. But if because you can go get one other guy and bring him in full time. The other is we get confused sometimes between compromising and losing. The reason why a lot of conservatives view the word compromise as a dirty word is because for X number of decades, we've been told by the press and by everyone else, you should compromise and raise taxes. <laughs> That's losing, okay? That's not a compromise. Compromise is when you're going in the, the direction you want to go slower than you would do it if it was just you. If there weren't any uh, opposing football guys on the other team, <laughs> I would run that way very quickly. But if I'm getting ahead five yards, 10 yards, 20 yards at a time, I'm compromising. I, I wanted everything, but there are these other guys who keep hitting me, so I don't always get everything that I want, but I'm moving in the right direction. So if you're trying to go from DC to Japan um, and you are in Missouri, that's not treason. Hey, you said we're going to Japan. We're only in Missouri is on the way to Japan. However, if your feet are wet and everybody around you is speaking French, you've been moving in the wrong direction, that's called losing, okay? So the left is, always says compromise when they mean lose, but we should never get confused that when we wanted three apples and we got one, who betrayed us? What happened here? Well, you know, if two were really on the table and available and somebody forgot to get them, okay, you can get, <laughs> then you could argue, but you may not, you, you may miss that there were different things stopping us from getting all three at once. Um, moving in the right direction more slowly than you want makes it possible. The other is, nobody in this room makes this mistake, but our friends in the press like to. Um, and that is talking about, what about those good old days about bipartisan compromise, okay? Uh, wasn't that great when everybody agreed? Well, that was true because when Richard Nixon and Ted Kennedy were around, Nixon wanted bigger government and Ted Kennedy wanted much bigger government. 
And you could agree between bigger and much bigger. You go to somewhat bigger. And then you play that game next year. Not bigger, not really bigger, just a little bit bigger. And, and Nixon goes, I, I kept him from going really big. And Kennedy goes, look how much I got. And so they keep getting to bigger government, even though you know, we're moving in the wrong direction. And somebody thought you know, that, that that was progress. Um, the other challenge you had, since nobody was arguing that the government should get smaller, Nobody with any political clout was. Anyway, uh, Goldwater said it, but he was one senator. Uh, with Reagan, you actually had a voting block that was originally, eventually put together. And we, got, we were one vote, within one vote of abolishing Obamacare and block granting all of Medicaid to the 50 states. Uh, you can decide who to be mad at. Trump called and yelled at him the day of the vote, and he, decided, he changed his mind and voted no. You know, one of the two of them should have been a bigger person than they were able to be. But so decide who you want to blame. But we fumbled that ball. We lost that ball ourselves. Next time we get a majority, no poking people in the nose if you want their vote. Um, doesn't work usually. Uh, so as we work on trying to put this together, the old days, the reason why everything was bipartisan was that the Jerseys told you nothing. If somebody was a Republican, they were born north of the Mason-Dixon line, it, they might be a liberal, they might be a conservative, you didn't know based on the R, okay? Kansas te was a Republican state because Lincoln was in Kansas with, with the North during the Civil War, and they, but the Republicans ran the state, so they were the government, so they're the tax increasing party. It was the Democrats with the anti-tax party up until about 15 years ago, because we run the government and we need money, get, you know, but we're running it well, conservatively. Um, Conservative big government. And so you had this thing where the two parties didn't tell you where somebody was ideologically. Now they do. I mean, that's why there's almost no Democrat, there's no Democrat in the Senate who won't vote for the PRO Act. And I don't think there are any Democrats who voted, that, that just organized labor, everything they want. Same thing in the House. I don't think we lost a single D vote in the House. There's no Republican to vote for a tax increase. So we really do have two very distinct parties that are going in different directions. And there are some principled compromises that you can get sometime, term limits. I used to work with uh, Ralph Nader on, he thought that if you had more term limits, um, you'd turn over elections more and, people, and you'd have fewer incumbents and everyone would want to uh, elect progressives. And I thought we'd do better on a conservative side if you had fewer incumbents running all the time and people didn't stay forever and get used to the swamp. Um, and so we both, for completely different reasons, we both agreed there should be term limits. Ditto transparency. Ralph Nader seemed to think if all government spending was completely transparent, you know, how much everybody made and how things were spent, that um, that people would go, you know, Myrtle, look at how the government's spending our money. We should send them more. Um, I, on the other hand, tended to think if people were pretty reasonably well-versed, accurately informed about what the government was doing with your money, they go, I wish they had less and I'm not giving them any more. But we could both agree that every citizen should be completely, it should, that the government should be transparent to citizens, to how are they spending money, what are they doing, that sort of stuff so you can see how, how money is spent. Um, so you can have agreements left right actually what you generally get is very conservative people and very liberal people because the present the status quo is what bipartisan compromise of the last 50 years got us it's what the people in power right and left all agreed to they hate term limits <laughs> they loved not having term limits because the term limits are not us the term limits are other people We're, we are the non-term limit people um, so the, you actually have right left efforts on politics sometimes, but they're principled in that neither party, the, the old idea of bipartisan compromise is we're gonna have a pizza, we're gonna put um, uh, shards of glass on it, because I like shards of glass and you don't, uh, and, 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 and we'll put the onions on because I like it and you don't, and we'll eat the pizza that neither of us like and we'll agree that this was great, right? No, <laughs> you, that doesn't make any, except there's more spun, spending in the big pizza that's what holds it together. So you can, we do get times when, and when left and right can get together on a principled issue where both actually, they just have a different understanding of what this law will do, okay? And chances are one of them's wrong. I try only to enter those things when the other team is wrong instead of me. Um, uh, so with those thoughts, I think we're in reasonably good shape. Uh, 
we have 30 states with the legislature running. In 10 of those, they're working to phase out the income tax. Um, the governor of uh, Iowa is cutting it from six and a half to a flat rate of four. The governor of, uh, uh, of uh, Oklahoma uh, is also doing a significant tax increase. Both of them want to go to zero. Uh, Mississippi, this House just voted 98 to 12 to phase out the income tax in 10 years. We're arguing with the idiots in the Senate. Um, in North, North Carolina, they've been phasing it down for seven years. It's now half where it used to be, and they passed a law that the corporate income tax disappears over the next six years automatically. In uh, New Hampshire, where they don't tax wages, but they do tax interest and dividends, the interest and dividend part of that tax is phased out to zero over the next five years automatically. No more votes need to be taken. Arizona's phasing their income tax down to two and a half, and then they go to zero. So we're doing reasonably well at the state level to, and if, if we flip Kansas and Virginia and become com wholly Republican states, they've both announced our goal is to phase down the income tax eventually towards zero. Uh, Louisiana is actually on a path to zero under present law. Um, so these are, and Wisconsin will pass a phase down to zero in the House and the Senate. Democrat governor will probably veto it. Last year we passed a very good tax cut and the jerk Republic Democrat governor v signed it so we couldn't run against him on that. So now we're back, okay, wise guy, you cut our taxes, well, let's phase them to zero. I think we're gonna keep him from signing it this time. If he signs it, we'll think of something else we have to have. Um, but uh, so across the states, the 50 states, we're making real progress on those. School choice, okay? 1983, I was at one of these meetings that Gingrich put together about this many people in the room, maybe 30 congressmen and some guys like me, and you'd sit at tables and your job was to come up and think of something interesting, and somebody said gold standard, flat tax, and somebody said school choice, and a very prominent conservative Republican, who you may remember his name, um, got up and said, if you're going to be talking about voucher school choice, I'm going to have to leave the room. This was a congressman. This is a guy who is right as rain on all issues, but scared to death that school choice would end his career. And 1983. Today, everyone goes, duh. Of course we're for this. I mean, it's, I don't quite know when the Overton window moved the way it did, and this became, well, yeah, of course we're for that. Um, but in New Hampshire, they have $4,500 per student, state money, money the state stole, um, taxpayer money held by the state, goes to $4,500 to eat to a school near your kid, the public school near your kid, whether your kid goes there or not. They said, oh, well, how about if we just give it to the kid's parents and they can homeschool with it? private school, parochial school, religious school, or they can go to the public school down the road from them if, if they want, then the money goes to them. So that's the law of the land for anybody who makes less than $80,000 a year. They're doing that now in Oklahoma without a limit. Doesn't matter how much money you make, the state money will go to you and go there. That's the new model. I mean, I thought everyone was gonna go to um, uh, the the uh, New Hampshire's very expansive model, but for lower, in, you know, for middle, lower income people, now they're saying, no, no, for everybody. Um, so these things are moving state by state. Real progress here. The more kids in private school, the more kids homeschool, the more Republicans, okay? The more defensive people are on the whole project. So um, with that said, I think we're in great shape. I know I'm pushing it on time. Thank you. Okay. This, you're gonna have a mic for people? Okay, this guy has a question. Mark Rhodes, former state senator from Illinois. Well, in Illinois, uh, we had a great columnist, Mike Rayko, and he came up with a contest for a new city seal for Chicago. And the winning entry was an outstretched palm under the slogan, Ubi est mea, for where's mine? <laughs> that typified the, the democratic uh, challenge of that time. Can but, we find a copy of that, of the? Sure. Okay. I can find it somewhere. Somewhere the Chicago Historical Society, they'll probably have it. Yeah. But it, it was a great slogan for that, for that time. But they're no longer uh, as eager to say, where's mine? Yeah, not out loud anyway. Yeah. Hi, uh, I agree with lowering state income tax. My question is, will this tend to 
make things more federal and give more federal power than state power uh, as that's where the dollars will be. Yeah. Very good idea. I, I did not get to, I'm just trying to squeeze on time. Um, the biggest project at the national level is to go to what Reagan wanted to do with welfare in 71, which was we spend X amount on welfare, divide it up among the 50 states based on population, here's your check, and it doesn't grow at all, or it, it grows with inflation, but not as rapidly as you're presently growing. So, and by the way, and you can have restrictions, like you have to be a citizen, or you have to be trying to work, or um, you, know, you can only do it for five years, whatever your state decides. So the feds give you a certain amount of money. When we did that, finally, under Clinton, uh, the average state dropped their spending on welfare, 30, aid to families with dependent children, by 30 to 40 percent. Now, mind you, there are another 184 different means-tested programs that people could move to, so th they, they moved away from welfare, but uh, the Paul Ryan plan, which has passed the House four times and the Senate once during Obama, so everybody got it and nobody lost an election, was you take all of the means-tested programs, Medicaid, the housing programs, the go-to-work programs that don't actually get anybody work, um, f uh, food stamps, and you say, bundle them all up. Here, Illinois, is your share, not a penny more. Okay, you want to spend it wisely, you can take the extra stuff and cut taxes or something. Um, but over time, states will figure out how to do it less expensively. They'll actually care about fraud because it's now their money. They don't care about the federal money being stolen, right? But they would care about their own money being stolen. Uh, and so watch, we should be able to take a lot of those welfare means-tested programs out to the states, and then red states will outshine blue states, not only because they cut taxes more, but because they spe they can take the same amount of spending and use it more competently and or use it, some of it for welfare and some for tax cuts and, and, and or building roads or something. But So it's their money, not Washington's. I think we devolve all of the means-tested stuff out to the states, and eventually that the, the federal highway tax should go to zero, and all states should raise, build their own roads. We've already built the federal system, the roads connecting everybody together. Uh, why you should pave something in the middle of Virginia with federal money is just silly, because some states have very bad laws, and the federal government has the worst laws on the Davis-Bacon law, which increases the cost of anything the government builds by somewhere between 10 and 25 percent because of labor union rules and things like that. Um, so get rid of Davis-Bacon, send it out to the states. Most states passed many Davis-Bacon bills, but they've now repealed them because they're so they're stupid even at the state level. Um, so states need to compete with each other to provide competent government at the lowest cost and keeping their taxes down. Uh, and I would just add um, that when we talk about getting rid of the income tax, I'm not talking about taking the income tax bill and sticking it on the, the, the sales tax. I'm talking about what each of these states is now doing, and that is when revenue comes in above a spending limit, what comes in above the spending limit will be used to pay down at the income tax. So this is how they did it for the last seven years in North Carolina. Revenue comes up, and beyond a certain point, you automatically cut the income tax half a point. You do it again the next year, and the next year, and the next year, and over time, it gets down. And if California had done that, they could have, 20 years ago, they could have abolished their income tax without raising any other taxes, just because spending would have not gone up as dramatically as it did. So we're not talking about pushing it off the income tax onto property taxes or sales taxes. We're talking about phasing it down as revenue comes, as you get more revenue than you expected or plan to spend, you don't give it to the teachers union to steal, you cut taxes. Last question? You choose, not me, then they can be mad at you. Uh, two issues you didn't mention that may well move votes, I think mm -hmm. they do. One is the um, unenforced border, and the other is protecting unborn children in the womb. <laughs> How does that fit into your analysis? Well, they, well, well, they both do, and they are vote-moving issues for people. One of the things we found years ago, 40 years ago, was that on the, uh, the pro-life issue, while the way they asked the question, it looked like more people were pro-choice than pro-life, but when you asked about who voted on it, there was some people said 8 to 4, 8% 8 people voted pro-life and 4% voted pro-choice on abortion. Others said 12 and 6. 
but it was always an advantage uh, on vote moving issues for um, the pro-life movement. Then the other things they'd do is they'd say, look, all the older people are pro, not all, but the older people are more pro-life than younger people. Wait 40 years, the old people all pass away and everyone will be pro-choice. And this was a Republican pollster talking to Alec and I raised my hand and said, that would be true if you make up your decision on the, the abortion issue when you're 15 or 18 and you just stick with it, but does it change when people get married or have kids? Oh, I don't know, that's a very good question. Somebody should pull that. Next. And, and what happens? It does change when people get older, when they have kids. Uh, and sonogram. So, I mean, th that is an issue that is both a vote-winning issue, although the chattering classes make it sound like it's not, okay? Um, and it, the question, is it leave us alone? Well, it depends how many people you think there are. If there are two people, you need to leave them both alone. And, and on the border, legal, legal immigration is very popular. Illegal immigration is not very popular. And you, you don't want a bunch of people coming in without knowing who they are, what they're doing. The Soviets used to send people over to be annoying. Uh, who knows what's coming across the border if you don't have some sort of regularity there. With the, the wall, that stopped this idea of flooding the zone, which the other team has decided to do when they <laughs> stopped building the wall um, and before they built the wall. So those are both issues that, that fit comfortably and the, the, the issue of what does it mean to be you know left alone. Uh, so that those are both comfortably in and working and net positive issues for the Republicans, vote moving issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Grover. Appreciate your time. And before, if you'll just join me one more time on stage and um, we'll present, yes, you. I will present you with this Adam Smith tie. Of course, you likely have a number of these, a club tie of the Reagan movement. I do not have a yellow one. Well, you now have a yellow one. If you're interested in uh, procuring your Adam Smith tie, scarf, or cufflinks, you can see Kathy up on the fifth floor. And hopefully I'll see you in just an hour with that tie on. Thank you so much, Grover. Unfortunately, Grover has to rush off to host his own Wednesday meeting with delicious donuts and questionable coffee. So he won't be able to stay and chat. Please allow him to clear a path. Join us on Wednesday. Thank you, Grover. Join us on Wednesday, March the 2nd, for our next Wednesday Wake Up Club Breakfast. Exciting speaker. We have one already to announce. Nicole Neely, the president of Parents Defending Education. If you know someone or you are a parent who has children in the public and government school system, you will want to be here. Um, I encourage you to RSVP online already at leadershipinstitute.org slash breakfast. And I'm looking for Mark Madsen. Mark. Mark, uh, join me on stage. I invite anyone interested to tour uh, of the Stephen P.J. Wood Building, where you are now, and the Emerson G. and Dolores G. Reinch Center for Campus Reform. To meet my friend Mark Madsen here at the podium, he will give you a great tour of the Leadership Institute and will be happy to answer any questions you might have. With that, happy Lunar New Year, friends, and you are dismissed. Thank you so much. on how many people are going.